when I tra transitioned from my job to flipping and then from flipping to multifamily, how we structured that is when we started the flipping business, I was still working full time as an engineer. I didn't quit until we sold the first flip. May I, and then we, we made as much as I made all year at my job. But then I quit my job. And then it was similar when we turned this into multifamily is we f we continued flipping at a lower volume um, for maybe a year, year and a half uh, until we got into the second multifamily deal. And then we're like, OK, this is going to work this. You know, we see a whole lot of potential here. Now we're going to drop the flipping and move full time into multifamily. Welcome to the Real Estate Hustlers podcast, where we have interviews with real estate investors and entrepreneurs about successes, failures, and hard-earned lessons. Through in-depth conversations, one-on-one -on -one listener coaching calls, and news analysis, you'll get a breakdown of real strategies that work for different niches and experience levels. Tune in to the number one real estate investing podcast every week to stay in the know. Now, here is your host, Josh Appleman. All right. Welcome to Real Estate Hustlers Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Appleman, founder and CEO of Appleman Capital. Today, we're joined with Andrew Cushman. Andrew is a formal chemical engineer. Andrew has transitioned from flipping homes to syndicating multifamily properties, managing over 2,700 units, also a ski in instructor and a surfer. Andrew enjoys family time and the outdoors adventures. Andrew, we appreciate you coming on the show today. If we could, listen, or if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, you got, you got the short version there. I uh, always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know how to do that. So I figured I could go be a chemical engineer and at least have a decent job. And, uh, did that for seven years, discovered house flipping here in Southern California. That was profitable, but also kind of like having another job. And, uh, in 2010, we said, what's the next big thing? Well, we had a big recession, so probably meant a big expansion, uh, half the people had lost their houses and couldn't buy one or were too scared to buy one. So that means we probably, you know, uh, no one can buy a house or wants to buy a house and a growing economy probably means the rental pool is going to be doing, is going to be really strong. And so we hired a mentor and, uh, learned the apartment game and have been doing it full time since 2000, full time apartments since 2011. And like you said, we've done about 2,700 units. It's been a really good business. Yeah. And that's, uh, and, and you started where everyone else starts at, which is basically zero. And then you learn from there, you learn from, from one transaction to two transactions to three transactions. Um, at what point, um, what was your volume like on, on uh, flipping that told you you need to get to the next phase? So we were in Southern California and we, when I say we, it's, I'm generally referring to my wife. She's, just, she's my business partner. Uh, it was just the two of us flipping. So we weren't like, you know, now you, guys, you have guys that have like seven figure flipping companies and it's like, it's a serious business. It was just, I, I was the guy making phone calls and knocking on doors. So we, pro, you know, we might flip five, six houses a year, but also we tried to go, because we knew we were going to be low volume, we tried to go really high margin. Um, and so that balanced out pretty well for us. Uh, so yeah, that, that we, we weren't, huge like doing 100 a year or anything like that we were doing like five or six a year i think all in all we did maybe 30 or something over four or five years got it but but the the time is of the essence and you i guess you figured the time you bought it the time you renovated it the time it took to sell that process is what takes forever to get done so you, time you need more money for it to make sense too versus going and, and buying say a 10 unit apartment complex where you can flip 10 houses in one building and then uh keep it or sell it off well, and that's one. Yeah, that was one of the many factors um, that drove us to move to multifamily was number what was it's just the scale of it. Would you rather flip a uh, hundred condos um, separately all over a, a large city or get an asset where you have a hundred of them on one parcel of land and in, you know, 12 buildings or something like that? And of course, yes, it is a longer timeline. You're not going to turn, you know, turn around a hundred unit apartment complex in six months or a year or something like that uh, but it's far more efficient and when we were flipping houses we'd you know sell a house make you know make some money on it put that in the bank and that was great but like you're back to zero you got nothing left to show for it i mean, I mean again, again I'm, and i'm not i'm not minimizing the fact that it is it can be a good profitable business it's a great step but what we decided is like okay we want to have grow something that 
yes, produces those equity chunks, but also has cash flow and builds lasting lasting wealth and something that is a little less transactional and in is you know longer term. So, yeah, I totally agree. It's a um, it, building up your your consistent revenue, but you still have you still have bills you have to pay. So you, you're you're wanting to build up your 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 rental portfolio, but you still have you have to meet the uh, the obligations. So did you keep flipping houses while you were building, while you're trying to learn syndications, while you're building up your portfolio? Yeah, that's a really good question because a lot of a lot of people you know you hear different things like well do both at the same time or you know burn the bridges and just. And it's kind of can feel like, okay, well, what should I actually do here? I tend to be a little bit more on the conservative side. So it, when, you know, when I tra transitioned from my job to flipping and then from flipping to multifamily, how we structured that is when we started the flipping business, I was still working full time as an engineer. I didn't quit until we sold the first flip. May, I, and then we, we made as much as I made all year at my job, but then I quit my job. And then it was similar when we transitioned into multifamily is we, f we continued flipping at a lower volume um, for maybe a year, year and a half uh, until we got into the second multifamily deal. And then we're like, okay, this is going to work. This, you know, we see a whole lot of potential here. Now we're going to drop the flipping and move full-time into multifamily. So uh, some people just go, you know, again, burn the bridges, jump, you know, jump or as uh, Reed Hoffman likes to say, you know, jump out of the airplane and plane and, you know, build a pair, you know, stitch together a parachute on your way down. Uh, I don't like, I'm not quite that adventurous. So, you know, we kind of, we kind of transitioned it a little bit. Yeah, I'd say, well, it's, and that's conservative. That's, uh, you, you still have some safe, safe havens put in there. So you, you're, you finally, you decided to get into multifamily, you got a mentor. And then I'm assuming that you started to learn how to underwrite, learned the language, learned the the lingo. At what point did you finally find your first deal? And then what did that look like? So our first multifamily deal is exactly what I recommend that everyone not do. Um, and then again, this was 2011, so very different time than we are now. It was a 75% vacant. 1960s 1970s neglected uh, apartment complex in macon georgia uh, it was 92 units and uh just to give you an idea of you know how rough it was and the pricing at the time we paid 7500 dollars a unit uh for wow. that for that property so that's <laughs> that's that's wild I don't, I don't know if we'll ever see 7,500 unit, uh, per unit again, at least uh, unless there's a major event. You, you know, what? I hope not because that probably means something really bad has happened. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So tell us, so you bought it at, a, it sounds like a great basis, but with that great basis, it sounds like it came with a lot of um, op opportunities. Uh, that's a that's a good euphemism for it. Yeah, opportunities. Uh, so it gave us opportunities to uh, learn how difficult renovations can be on a very old property. Uh, gave us opportunities to learn uh, how uh, certain neighborhoods can make uh, asset management uh, that much more difficult. Uh, it gave us opportunities to learn of you know what kind of the older properties you buy, the the amount of headaches that you're signing up for uh, go up exponentially. And so it, you know, it, it, and then also managing that stuff from, you know, across the, across the country, which is, that was actually one of the reasons we went straight to our first deal was 92 units is because we wanted something big enough that would support onsite full-time employees because we knew we were going to manage from, from, the, from California and this is in Georgia. Um, it was very difficult. So, you know, when I tell people don't do this, we, what we did is we bought a, you know, C minus D plus property in a economically declining market. And none of those things are something you want to do to be a good long-term investor. Uh, what I would do differently is just buy a, a slightly better property in, you know, meaning, uh, you know, you, you hear people say about A class, B class, C class, C, C and D is the rough stuff. B is kind of the workforce and A is really nice to, to simplify it down. I would actually go straight to B. Uh, because when we look back over the last you know 15 years and 2700 units the highest profits with the least headache was actually all our class b stuff uh, but getting back to that first deal the biggest thing is that we did it um, because i probably wouldn't be talking to you if we hadn't just jumped and actually just done something 
Um, and it did work out. I mean, I mean, so many things did not go to plan, but we did end up selling it. We re, re, refinancing it. Then we ended up selling it for, you know, multiple times what we paid for it a few years down the road. Um, so it was a profitable deal, uh, but it was uh, very well earned, I guess you could say. Sounds like being in trenches the entire time, just figuring out the next fire to put out. Yeah, that deal is part of why I'm so gray now. So <laughs> that can and it can happen. I mean, that's uh, that's when you first take up a property. Let, let's let's ask this: when you first purchase a property, what does that process look like when you your, your take up a process? Yeah, so you know how how it works in apartments is you know in single family you make an offer and you kind of. You know, maybe go back and forth a little bit. You sign the agreement, and then then it closes. In multifamily, first you submit what's called an LOI or letter of intent, and it's it's basically a, a kind of a summary of your offer. Like, hey, I'm going to offer you these this this price, and uh, we're going to try to close in this many days, and you know this this some other stuff in there. But it's just it's a letter of intent. It's not binding. And that usually ends up getting negotiated. And then if you agree on it, then you go to a PSA, which is a purchase and sale agreement. That is your legal per agreement to buy the property. It can take, I mean, I think the fastest I've ever had one done is three or four days. And I've had those take two months because all the, everybody lawyers up and then they got to argue over everything. And those things will be 30, 40, 50 pages long. And so what we do is, is during the process of negotiating that purchase and sale agreement, we try to do as much remote um, due diligence as possible, meaning we're diving super deep into rent comparables, um, you know, the health of the market, new construction, crime, just all the things that can affect the performance of a rental property. And then the minute we sign that agreement, uh, we will actually show up with a team of people. It could be eight, 10, 12 people, depending on the size of the property. Um, now, in the ver that very first deal, it was me, um, my mentor, and like a couple of inspectors, and you know a few other people that I roped into it. So don't, don't, you know, don't anyone listening, don't feel like you, you know, you can't do due diligence without ten people. It's just it grows as the assets get bigger. So as soon as we sign that agreement and we are, you know, we're going to have a legal contract to transact, we show up with our team and a bunch of contractors and we try to look at every aspect of that property. Uh, we somebody reads every single lease of I mean, even if there's 250 leases, someone actually reads through all 250. They sit in the office and they do that for a couple of days. Um, we look at the wiring, the roofs, the windows, the you know the 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 foundations, the landscaping, every physical thing we inspect, and we we also go inside every single unit. Um, so if you've got if you're buying a fourplex, go inside all four units. Do not accept an excuse. Oh, we lost the key, or oh, she won't let us in, or like you the one unit you don't go into. That's going to be the unit that's an old meth lab that no one told you about, and now you got a serious problem, right? So, even if, so that we even if it's through again three hundred units, we will walk every single one of them, and again we're doing this with contractors and, and all kinds of different people, and we put to get that lets us fine tune the business plan for okay, here's how much money we're going to need to spend on this, um, you know the. Uh, seller originally told us the average rent was a thousand dollars, but we just analyzed all the leases, and now we know it's actually nine hundred and sixty-five. You know, there's there's a huge long list, but that's kind of a quick summary of it. Yeah, that's that's part. So that's the due diligence part, and then you finally close on the um, on the property, and now you get to find out who the bad actors are, who the uh, the, the typically the drug dealers, the ones who don't want to pay rent, the ones who have the excuses. That's where it gets really fun. This is the first couple months of uh, of the close, and then you're—I mean—you're going through a reposition at that point, regardless. I'm sure you underwrite in the variance of of what the, uh, the rent roll says we're bringing in, but and then what it actually is—the effective rent roll. What uh, what is your pro what is your your process after you actually close on a property? Um, so, well, and actually, and I would say, you know, you mentioned the cleaning out the drug dealers and all that stuff. That is true. I have done a whole lot of that. That is the stuff that you deal with in class C or lower. Oh, yeah. If you, if you go, if you do go to class B or even maybe A minus, you will deal with far less of that kind of thing. Um, 
I see. Uh, so, Josh, you asked about what the the process was after as soon as ever after we close. And if it's a class C and a B area, those are usually the hidden gems too, where you can reposition the the, the complex, get it to where the the neighboring properties appreciate what you're what you're doing, what you've done. Yeah, you're exactly right, and that is where some of the the biggest value value add is is if you find a property that, due to usually owner neglect or, or something along those lines, is far below what it should be for the neighborhood. If you go in and, and put in the expertise and the work, that's where you can make a lot of profit, especially in multifamily. One mistake, though, that I see really common is I think it's just uh, optimism, maybe. Um, but is people buying a C property in a C neighborhood and saying, all right, we're going to turn this into a B. It doesn't work that way. You can't take the property above the neighborhood. You, you It's, it's got to be the other way around. Yeah, so. 100%. Uh, but as far as like when you all when you when you purchase a property and then you're you're working with third party property management, correct? Yeah, so we use third party property management. Um, you know, that's an ongoing debate. Do you manage yourself? Do you use third party? We could do a whole podcast episode on how you make that decision. Um, but what we do is really kind of a hybrid model. Or we we do have a same a third party property management company that we've worked with since the beginning, but we very very closely asset manage um, them, and we have we have a couple of employees on our team that typically would be property management type people. So and they help us kind of integrate. So we do use third party because I, I don't if you're going to be an investor, you really don't want to be dealing with the fact you know the argument because. You know, the lady in 3C lets her bar lets her dog bark at night, and the guy in 4B is really pissed off because it pooped on his front patio. Like filing evictions, all that kind of stuff. That kind of routine admin high headache stuff is for us anyway is best left to somebody who specializes in that and just has built the systems for that. And, and we we see ourselves as investors. And so we want to really closely manage them as they do that. And then we're looking at bigger pictures of, you know, new markets, new assets, you know, when do we buy, when do we sell, when do we refinance, et cetera. Yeah, that's huge. And, and property management has so many different components to it to where if you have somebody just kind of tapping on the shoulders of somebody else, it keeps everyone in line and keeps your, your, uh, your property performing. What are your, what, what do you feel like your, your highest, um, uh, highest and best KPIs are to, to make sure that the property stays on track. Um, it kind of it depends a little bit on what stage the property is in. If we're in the position of repositioning it, or if it's already stabilized. Uh, but I would say, you know, as an investor, your number one thing is net cash flow. Uh, one thing I see a lot is in, in net cash. So you have in, in multifamily, you have you know net operating income, and it's just all of your income minus all of your operating expenses. So it gives you the net of those two is your operating income. However, what's a bit tricky is that doesn't include cap X or capital expenditure. So if you buy a you know put on a new roof that costs twenty thousand dollars. That doesn't get factored into the net operating income. It actually comes, it gets factored in what's called below the line. And so you'll see a lot of properties, you know, come up for sale or whatever. Um, or if you just, you own it yourself, you're not paying close attention. You're like, wow, I'm doing great. My net operating income is, you know, $10,000 a month. But then you look down below that, which is, and what I mean below it, it's literally, it's below the line on the, on the spreadsheet. Um, I say, oh, well, we're spending you know, $12,000 a month on roofs and appliances and countertops that doesn't get shown there. So even, so you may have a property that looks profitable, but in reality, you're losing money because that capital expenditure money, yes, it doesn't show on the net operating income, but it still comes out of your bank account. Um, so that, like, if there's one metric to boil it down to, it's the true net cash flow. And then, you know, but beyond that, you can get into things like, you know, occupancy. Um, these days, we're real big on renewal rates. We want to see 75% of our residents renew and stay in the unit because then we don't have to clean it. We don't have to fix it up. We don't have to, 
you know, have vacancy. We don't have to spend marketing efforts or money, or we don't have to spend money on marketing effort. Um, you know, so we have, you know, those. Um, and then part of what we do is we tie managers compensation to the net operating income so that if, as the, as they make the property succeed or help the property succeed, their income goes up. Um, so, but again, if I were to boil it down to one is true net income and then, you know, revenue and renewal rates and occupancy and all the standard things that you know you could you, you'd hear on a, uh, any kind of real estate podcast or book got it you all are um, when you all buy properties you're uh, you've got a capex budget i'm assuming it goes along with the purchase mm -hmm. yes is that something you're do you let the uh, property management manage all of the renovations and you all are are managing those as well alongside of them or is that third party another third party that comes in and does those that's a yeah. So we um, we basically manage it in house, but we lean on. So the uh, the property management company we, that we use has an insight uh, kind of renovation team, and but what we do is we have them. They have real long standing relationships with lots of contractors and vendors. So what we t typically do is we lean on them for getting the bids. So like let's say we need a new roof. Well, okay, you know. Christian, can you please get three bids on replacing this roof? And okay, they'll go do that. Then they send it to us and then we'll make the final decision on, okay, who we're going to use, how much we're going to pay. And then um, when we're doing major renovations, like you just bought a property and maybe, you know, Josh, it's the example you said of take, trying to take a C to a B and you got a lot of moving components. Again, we will lean on them, the, pro the property management company for, Thing, you know, kind of simple things like getting bids and we'll, we certainly get their advice like, hey, you know, if you guys own, you know, if you guys manage five other properties in this market is, you know, we, you know, what are you seeing? Are you, are you, you know, getting rent bumps for putting in granite or is laminate good enough? Right. So we'll, you know, get a lot of their input, a lot of their advice. But we actually manage the renovation ourselves because we found it. um tends to go a little bit better with a little bit more accountability. And then also most management companies charge five, six, 7% uh, renovation management fee. And so, so what that means is if, you know, if you're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars renovating your fourplex, well, that management company is going to want $7,000 on top of that cost for if they're going to manage it for you. Yeah. And then plus you'd have some of the various expenses going out for this and that, um, uh, You've got twenty seven hundred plus units, so you've you've seen the good, the bad. You've been in you've been in some, I'm, I'm sure, some interesting deals. What has been one of the what, one of the most um, I'm going to say learning lesson deals that you've that you've had so far? Well, one is definitely that first one that I told you about. Um, you know, the second one is the worst syndication that we that we've ever done. And what uh, this again? This was early on. I want to say twenty thirteen. We bought a 348 unit C minus property in a maybe C. Uh, in reality, I'd say C minus neighborhood of, of, of South Dallas. And um, we had a, uh, a renovation budget and we would renovate units and we would get a nice rent bump. But then the demographics were so challenging in that neighborhood that people would move in stop paying rent six months later. And then once we get them out, they would destroy the unit. And so we'd have not, we couldn't just like, you know, clean it and paint up, do, do paint touch-ups. We'd have to renovate the unit again. And so the that property just sucked up cash far more than we anticipated. Mostly again, in CapEx and repairs and maintenance and just ongoing, uh, uh, ongoing costs. And then again, being in a rough neighborhood, we had somebody crawl, climb up under the roof of the leasing office, knock out the skylights and throw Molotov cocktail, cocktails into the leasing office and trying to burn it down. They didn't burn it down, but they did do $30,000 worth of fire damage. Uh, that property also had what's called a chiller system, which is th these are common in places like Texas and some other parts of the South where the entire property is basically on one giant air conditioning unit. Well, guess what happens when it's August? If you're in a low-income neighborhood in Texas, and the air conditioning goes out on all 350 units at once. 
people get cranky and mad really fast. And you're a lot of people in tight quarters. Uh, I mean, we had all kinds of stuff going on. I, I, I keep a, I used to keep, uh, disappeared, a small piece of metal on my computer tray um, as a reminder to that we would never buy that kind of stuff again. And what that was, was that was a spent bullet that I pried out of the drywall walking a unit one time. Um, so like that property, and we, and what happened is with, you know, what the end result was is after a couple of years, we said, well, we still think we can turn this around, but in 2015, everyone thought a recession was coming in 2016. And we said, well, in a recession, these kind of properties get even worse. And we did not want to risk losing money. So we just sold early, made a very small profit and said, we're going to move on to better stuff. And so we never, we've never bought anything like that again. Um, that was, you know, that, that was, that was the toughest deal uh, that we ever did. Um, it was large, it was old, neglected, so many difficult things with that property. But if I look at all of the, you know, a lot of the super successful deals after that, those deals were really successful because of the things that we learned not to do on that big one that I just mentioned. Yeah, that, that's, that's huge. Well, that goes, I guess those properties just keep retrading. Is that uh, until somebody keeps this bottoms out at some point? Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, uh, you know, they just uh, want, you know, they just cut just some, the, the, the broker or the owner just looks for the nep the next overly optimistic, uh, you know, uh, investor. And, um, yeah, uh, tries to, you know gets them to buy them. And, well, and, and, and so yeah, you know it's interesting, Josh. Is those pro those properties tend to take two paths. If they're in like gentrifying neighborhoods or neighborhoods that are getting better, then what happens is people tend to come in and do like major renovations, and like and the properties actually get better. I mean, you'll go to some cities and there'll be like 1940s apartment complexes that the rent's $3,000 a month because it's in a nice area now, and somebody's really fixed it up. But then the other side, which is probably what would happen to this property eventually, is it just becomes functionally obsolete and either becomes really bad or gets demolished or something like that. Yeah, it's, that goes to show that, like you had mentioned earlier, you, can't, you can change a property, but you can't change the area, at least unless it's gentrifying. And that's, that's a whole another time horizon on itself, but it just mm -hmm. takes, takes time to get there. Uh, for the for the listeners, what would you recommend the path be for somebody who wants to get into multifamily? So the yeah, what I would recommend is number one, don't try to time the market. Like that doesn't work. You you I mean yes, you can get an idea of some big cycles. Like you know, in two thousand and ten, it was kind of it was kind of obvious. Like okay, it feels like we're near the bottom. In twenty twenty one and twenty two, it's like okay, it feels like we're you know pretty much near a top. But you can't time it exactly right. So my first recommendation is if you're going to go into multifamily and it's going to be a longer term thing, meaning, you know, you're not just looking to flip something in two or three years, which I would not recommend trying to do right now. Um, start now. Don't by the time that you wait for multifamily or any investment class to be, you know, popular and everybody's talking about it and and everything's pointing to, to you know up and to the right you've missed the boat because that's when you've got 10 million other people trying to do it competing against you that's when it's super hard to find deals um and that's when you're going to pay way more and that's what you know the people who did that in 2021 and 22 are all the people who are in trouble right now um particularly in multifamily. so number one recommended is just go ahead and get started and if you, you know, if you buy a property today and it's in a growing submarket, meaning population and job growth, um, you manage it well, you properly capitalize it with, you know, set aside enough money for repairs and, you know, capex and all that. You put the right debt on it, meaning you don't get a bridge loan or something that has to be paid off in two or three years. So maybe something that's seven or 10 years. And you and again, and you manage it well. That will succeed. Um, we are going to have in a, in about 2026 onward. We're going to have our housing shortage is going to be far more severe than it is now, and it looks very likely rents will be accelerating upwards. And I would challenge anybody who's a little scared about trying to get into the market right now, try to find an apartment owner who bought a building 
20 years ago and still owns it and regrets owning that building, right? You're not because over time, over the long run, again, the buying in the right markets and managing them well, uh, commercial, it, I, I believe if you go back like a hundred years, you can't find a 10 year period in US history where the value at the end of the 10 years isn't higher than at the beginning of the 10 years. And the, the, the longer you wait, the, the harder it is and the further behind you get. So I would say if you're truly interested in doing it, get started. Um, if you're like, I don't even know, you know, what to, what to say or do get on places that, you know, you obviously you're listening to this podcast. That's a right start. Um, you know, there's, you know, read some books, listen to real estate, you know, other real estate podcasts, go to real estate meetups, start meeting people who have similar interests. And maybe I, I really, what you're really looking for is somebody who's one step ahead of you and see how much, get as much information as you can get from them. So. Yeah. One more note before we sign off. What are what, what are your, your outlook for the interest rates? Uh, I mean, we've got the ten year that keeps going up. It's, it's closer to five now. What are you seeing on that front? Um, you know, so I tend to operate on a probability curve, meaning we kind of say, all right, well, here's a bit. You know, not we don't say ah, we think ten years to be at five percent. We say, well. You know, it seems most probable that uh, it's going to stay somewhere around four and a half for a good part of 2024. But there's a legitimate case to argue why it could end up significantly lower or significantly higher. Higher, right? Jamie Dimon, the uh, the CEO of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, he just came out with his letter, and he basically said they're planning on inter on the 10 year being somewhere between two and 8%. Like those are massively different outcomes in massively yeah. different investment markets. Right. So, you know, if I were to guess, I would say it probably without some kind of extra event happening, it probably, the interest rates probably don't change a whole lot this year. Um, you know, could they go down in 25 and 26? Yeah, I could see that. I could also see them not going down. Um, so I know that's super helpful to say, well, it could be this or it could be the opposite. But that's actually kind of the point is when you're investing, number one, you're, it is not a successful strategy to just wait around until you get a magic interest rate that works for you because there's no such thing. Um, the interest rates of the last five, 10 years were a, an extreme anomaly. We probably will never see that again. Um, and then number two, you know, if you look at the, the really wealthy, successful real estate investors that have been doing this 20, 30, 40 years, they've seen interest rates from zero to 20%, yet they've still made it work and still made it prof profitable. So, you know, again, if I, to answer the question directly, I'm going to guess the 10 year, the, the federal funds rate uh, ends the year, probably not too far from where it is today. Um, but I think everyone's way too focused on that. You need to buy investments and structure them so that they do well they almost no matter what happens to interest rates because otherwise you'll just sit around and do nothing yeah it's, now we're into stagflation so it could it could linger and but mm -hmm. at the same time like you'd mentioned real estate right now is on a discount so take advantage of the times underwrite it make sure it cash flows and uh just let time do its thing uh andrew if somebody wants to reach out to you and learn more about you your company possibly invest with you how can they get a hold of you yeah, there's two ways, really. One, um, you know, I don't do uh, social media other than LinkedIn. Um, so I do post on there. And if you comment, uh, that is me responding. It's not a, a AI bot or, uh, you know, VA in the Philippines or anything like that. So um, if you want to connect and, and talk, uh, LinkedIn's good. And then our website is uh, short for Vantage Point Acquisitions. It's bpacq.com. And there's a couple of tabs on there for uh, how to get in touch with us. Awesome. Andrew, definitely appreciate your time today. I will certainly be following you. We'll talk soon.